this is a regional webinar with uh, both Haywood Community College, Southwestern, and Tri-County Community College, and we're really excited to be able to bottle up all of Smithson's knowledge and provide mm -hmm. this information to you in a series of webinars where we will be, for the, the following four Tuesdays, we will be hosting these webinars. And so for those of you that don't know Smithson, he is the executive director of uh, Blue Red Food Ventures based out of Asheville, sort of the Inca Candler, AB Tech campus. And he comes to us with a lot of really um, fascinating knowledge and background. I met Smithson years ago with his work with the North Carolina Rural Center. And so he's just a really strong advocate for both nonprofits, um, rural communities, food, um, our food community. And I would read his entire bio, but I don't think that Smithson probably wants me to do that. But I can tell you that he's worked in business development um, consulting for the past decade and focus on rural economic development, food and agriculture and infrastructure development. And so he, his background um, serves him well in this capacity and we're, we're fortunate and blessed to have a Smithson in Western North Carolina. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Smithson. Why, thank you, Tiffany. I appreciate that. It's nice to have a Smithson in Western North Carolina from my perspective as well. Um, <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I don't know who all's here in the room, so to speak, the virtual room. Um, I was, Tiffany, is it still possible for us to have brief introductions from the participants or should we just proceed with the presentation? Um, yeah, is there like a specific thing you want them to say just to, to like, keep uh, it short? You, yeah, that would be if, if possible, if you could just sort of state your name and why you're attending this and what you're interested in uh, value added foods. And that will help me sort of understand what your needs and expectations are. And um, so we can improvise as needed. Okay, so I'm gonna just one at a time allow you to talk. So I'm gonna start with um, Mr. Johnson, you're going to have to unmute yourself. And maybe we just let them put it in the chat. That might be easier. Yeah, and I can't see chat with the with the PowerPoint up, so I'm not sure how that works. I can read it for you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you right. are, William. You're unmuted now. You can tell us um, about your business and uh, what's happening with you. Uh, can you hear me first? Yes. Yes. Okay, just checking. Wasn't sure how the mic situation was. Um, my business is a, kind of a like a hot sauce condiment kind of business. I make hot sauces, uh, mustards, ketchups, barbecue, steak sauces, stuff like that. And I'm I'm trying to get my I'm trying to get off the ground and. Uh, it's been quite a pretty penny and I still got a little, little ways to go right now. I think the only thing I have left to do is, um, is get the food tested, uh, NC state and just, and the kitchen inspection, which hasn't been going on due to the COVID. So I think that's the only two things that have me hold back. Um, but since you're asking me questions about my business, I, I got a question for you just real fast. Like, uh, is there like small business grants for stuff like I'm doing? Yes, there are. Laura? Yes, yes, there are. I, I'd be happy to, at the end of the session, we're going to talk about uh, the funding we have to support value added. So okay, cool. we have a lot of support. It's really exciting. <laughs> it, it will be worth your time to stay on the line. <laughs> oh, heck yeah, I'm excited. All right, me too. All right, All right. next I'm going to go to Catherine. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hi there. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this. Smith, Smith and I, I attended your um, Ag Business Seminar there in Asheville, and I think it was in January, late January or February. I really enjoyed that, and I'm glad to see you're at the helm again, so thank you for that. Um, my husband and I have a small farm in Waynesville, west of Asheville, and we are raising a heritage breed hog called the Mangalista pig. It's a lard pig, and it takes a long time 
to get to the processor 18 months or more. Mm. And so we've been selling to restaurants because certainly with that much um, time and um, inputs into that animal, which we happily make, we still need to make money on it. And um, with restaurants seem to be the ones that can afford it. And um, it's a very high price per pound. However, we are looking into moving into retail cuts because of the COVID crisis. And um, instead of just maintaining these hogs indefinitely, go ahead and process them and put them in the freezer. So my questions are, um, what would be maybe the primary infrastructure that we would have to now obviously address at the farm? We have labor considerations, labeling. Um, I've, I've researched um, some on USDA and the um, food services inspection or safety inspection service. Um, so it's labeling, retail cuts, special, I've gone through the website, so I'm not asking you to, to hold my hand for that, but necessarily if there's any extra advice that you might have and going from something that was pretty much a hands-off situation where we took the animal, the processor and the animal was delivered. Now we're looking at a whole new ball game of moving into retail. And of course that would entail packaging, sales, you know, online marketing. So mm -hmm. that's a lot to, to take in, but I'm sure other people have businesses that are transitioning in the same way, just with different factors. So thank you in advance. Yeah, and if I could make a quick comment, th this is, uh, yeah, a lot of people who have been uh, overly dependent upon the restaurant trade are now backing up and saying, okay, how do I get into the retail avenues? Because that obviously is booming, whereas the restaurants are dead for the time being. Um, do you have a good relationship with a slaughterhouse right now for your hogs? Yes, I do. Good, good. That, that's key. Um, as far as uh, packaging and labeling, I mean, if you have a USDA slaughterhouse that you're working with, they're the ones obviously who are going to apply that label. So are you, were you thinking of doing any further processing away from the slaughterhouse or were you going to have everything done turnkey there to sell? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, this is the caveat. We have to slaughter at such a high weight and then we need them scalded and they're only, well, I can only find really one near me um, that's within two or three hours to do that. Then I would have to have them transferred potentially down to Piedmont um custom meats because yeah. they could do they could render the lard and they could do the retail cuts and all of that the 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 quandary is this or the catch-22 is this on their website they're no longer doing rendering lard and those um certain sausages and things like that because they're overwhelmed with just the processing in general so right. i know that i can process the lard now i would have to move potentially into a uh, uh, an inspected commercial kitchen. I know Blue Ridge, you all don't do any animal products at your adventures, uh, correct? We're not under USDA inspection. Okay, That's the difference. okay. Yeah. And the reason we don't is because the USDA inspectors don't like the idea of shared use access. They want it to be one legal entity that is entering the room at all times and has all responsibility for the processing. So it defeats the general model that we have of shared use access. Yeah, and that makes total sense to me. If I was doing a hot sauce, I wouldn't want to have, have had pigs in there, you know. Yeah, and hope that yeah it makes sense. Sure it does. Sure, it totally mm -hmm. does. So, so that, is, that is one of the biggest challenges, Smithson, is um, processing at one place, moving to another, getting some things done at, at, place, at processor number two, or potentially picking everything up and processing it and I guess what would be a rented or a leased commercial kitchen um, here near me in, in Waynesville, I, I guess with restaurants going out of business, there are gonna be a lot of kitchens available. So as sad as that's- Yeah, um, probably, Laura, something for you to note is that um, for Catherine's needs, um, the folks at NC Choices may be the best consultants for her. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. I'd be happy to talk with you uh, offline about that. Um, NC Choices is a fantastic resource for farmers in your position. So um, we can talk offline and we've got lots of support for your business too, so. Y'all have been great, wonderful, thank you. All right, so 
now I need to I think this is Harlow. I think I've just unmuted you. If you'll just introduce yourself and where you're located. So uh, we're located in uh, Gloucester, North Carolina. Um, we grow all different types of herbs, but we're also making uh, oil infusions and selling those to uh, restaurants. Okay, great. Thank you. Where's Gloucester? Uh, it's about 15 minutes uh, from Beaufort. Oh, okay. I used to live in Beaufort. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, you know, the questions I kind of had was I talked with the Department of Health and they were saying because I was doing infused oils with um, that, they really, they didn't know whether or not if, if the kitchen needed to be inspected or not. They said no which was kind of odd. Have you spoken to the food and drug inspectors with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture? I have, and they said the same thing. They just said because it was just a, a real simple process, they didn't see any need to, which I was kind That's of... That's great. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I mean, that, well, yeah, but that kind of puts a red flag. I mean, I usually I was thinking that they would want to inspect versus hmm. you know what I'm saying? I mean I just yeah. didn't know if that was I was living in fantasy world. Hmm. <laughs> well, real quick what I would do is since you're you're bottling a product, you clearly are under the food and drug inspection service, not the county health department. So right. they're the okay. ones who are going to decide what you need to be doing. Um, mm -hmm. And so working closely with them and making sure you have a written standard operating procedure for how you do each product that you make, whether you're yeah, they inspected told me, or yeah. not, having that is okay. pretty important. Yep. Yeah, they told me to and, do that. Okay. Yeah. And um, also, just for clarification, there's when it comes to non-meat processing facilities, there's really no there's no classification of an inspected kitchen versus an uninspected kitchen. There is oh, okay. there is a kitchen that is in compliance, and there's a kitchen right. that's not in compliance. Whether or okay. not you're inspected, you are expected to be in compliance at all times. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, no, no pets yeah. in the house, in, in the kitchen, right. things like that. And okay. the food and drug people can walk you through what they're basically looking for, whether or not they come inspect you. They can tell you what they're kind of looking for. Okay. Yeah, I got the, I got the, they, they gave me all that information. Okay. And such. I was just looking to protect myself, you know, legally. <laughs> I just oh, want to have yeah. it all, you know, have it all in place and then go, oops, you wish you're selling and we wanted to do this final review. That's yeah. all. I was just making sure that that doesn't happen. As long as you're getting it from their mouth, and I would also encourage you to get everything in writing from them okay. and just, just mm -hmm. comply with what the food and drug inspector in your region asks you to do. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on. Let's see. Angela, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Angela. Okay, maybe we'll circle back around to her. You can also comment in the chat too if you're having difficulty so we know. Okay, she has, she has put some stuff in the chat here real quick. Um, these are questions. Angela, if you could just tell us where you are located and what type of farm or value added. She's in Cary, North Carolina. Okay. And what do you produce or hope to produce?
Italian food importing. Mm. <laughs> you made us all hungry. <laughs> all right. Smithson? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and throw this back over to you and let you get started on your. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, welcome again. Um, I will um, preface everything I am going to say by telling you I've never led a Zoom meeting before in my life. I've been oh attending goodness. them for the last three months, but I haven't actually um, given any presentations. So I apologize in advance <laughs> for any uh, mistakes or gaffes or uh, inappropriate things that I, I, I need to learn not to do. <laughs> <laughs> and before you Let's dig go. in really quick, yeah. let me just remind everybody, as you have questions, if you will just put those in the Q&A, and Laura is going to moderate those, and so as the timing is appropriate, she will um, pitch those to Smithson. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. Cool. Okay, now I'm done. Um, okay, so so this, this presentation today was developed as part of a, a four-session uh, educational tool. Um, and uh, so this is the introductory um, presentation as we go further into different components of it, different presentations will get more specific. But this is the general one sort of to give you an idea of what if you're if you're uh, an aspiring business in value added foods, it's important for you to know the industry that you're dealing with. So I'm going to walk you through some of the most important things that we need to know about value added food. Um, how is it defined? The U.S. Department of Agriculture is the definition that we follow. They have three different characteristics. The first is the most obvious, a change in the physical state or form of the product, such as milling wheat into flour or making strawberries into jam. From what I understand, all of you are involved in value-added. Meat processing, ipso facto, is, is value-added processing. Um, same goes for oil infusions, for making jams and jellies or hot sauces. Um, the Italian food, probably most all of that is also a value added, cha changed in form. The second definition uh, is the production of a product in a manner that enhances its value, such as organically produced products. If you grow with organic chemicals um, that are certified by the OMRI Organic Materials Research Institute, then you are producing a value added product. And the third is the physical segregation of an agricultural commodity or product in a manner that results in the enhancement of the value of that commodity, such as an identity preserved marketing system. Um, many of you live in Western North Carolina and know that, for instance, uh, ASAP, Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project, has a, uh, an Appalachian grown label. Applying that label to your product, even if it's simply non-organic um, lettuce, that is a value added component having that 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 identity preserved system um, generally speaking however most of the value added products that we deal with are uh, in the first definition let's talk about food as an industry it's a very interesting industry it is the largest single industry on the planet and um, it's interesting in that Food and agriculture is often poo-pooed as sort of a, uh, a, a low-tier sort of economic activity because it's universal. Um, but I have noticed that when I worked for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, I had a lot of interaction with people in the Department of Commerce. And commerce kind of, you know, sometimes they kind of poo-pooed food. They were like, we're into tech and wafers and chips and things like that, not the ones that you eat. Um, but as soon as the economy went south, the commerce guys would always call up the ag guys and say, are you guys doing anything? Like, yeah, we're busy. We're always busy because food is always going to be there, even if the rest of the economy goes belly up. Unlike other sectors, food is a biological necessity and it has tremendous staying power. Whether the economy's hot, whether the economy's cold, people are still going to eat. Their behavior will change, but they're still going to be consuming food. It's also highly fragmented, diversified, and fluid with hundreds of businesses exiting and entering every single year. Um, this year is probably uh, exceptional as far as the number of businesses exiting, but that will also create vacuums in demand, which will create opportunities for new businesses to enter. It's a very interesting and dynamic time for the food industry. 
is also increasingly regulated and becoming more difficult to enter to gain and retain market share. Um, the good news about the Food Safety Modernization Act, which has created a lot of new uh, requirements for uh, legal entry into the food industry, is that people are, you know, there's a, there, there's a lot more safety involved in food production now than there has ever been before. If you are an individual or a business that can meet the criteria for selling into the marketplace under new uh, Food Safety Modernization Act uh, requirements, you have overcome a hurdle that keeps other people from entering, if that makes sense. So if you can get that certification, whatever it happens to be, then suddenly you are in a, in a competitive position. Major value-added food sectors. I'm not going to read every bit of this, but meat and poultry by, and far, by, by far is the largest value-added sector of the food industry, followed by dairy. Then we have acidified foods, pickles, condiments, things like that, um, vegetarian and vegan proteins, hummus, tempeh, tofu, seitan, and veggie burgers are popping right now. Um, retort canned goods such as fish, vegetables, and soups. Uh, boy, canned goods have suddenly taken on a new shine in COVID land. I went to Sam's Club and bought $197 worth of canned food uh, on about March 10th, and I think we just finished all of it. <laughs> we may have a little bit of canned chicken left. Uh, baked goods, and drinks, non-alcoholic and alcoholic sodas, juices, fermented drinks, and functional drinks. The 15 largest food companies in North America uh, are as follows, Pepsi, Tyson, Nestle, JBS, which is a Brazilian meat processor, Kraft Heinz, Anheuser-Busch, Smithfield Foods, located in North Carolina, Coca-Cola, General Mills, Mars, Cargill, Saputo Incorporated, which I'm not really sure what they do, Kellogg, Hormel, and Pilgrim's Pride. About half of those are involved in meats, and the other half are massive conglomerates that produce just about everything you can imagine under the sun. Um, when you look at this, if you're a little tiny food manufacturer and you look at this and like, my God, how can I compete with all of these massive behemoths? They had $260 billion in sales in North America. That must be the entire marketplace, right? Wrong. They only make up 15 to 20% of the total food market in North America. The rest is highly, highly fragmented and diversified among 30,000 different food manufacturing facilities owned by about 25,800 companies in the US. So um, the good news is that anybody, just about anybody with a little bit of gumption and a little bit of capital can get into some level of value added food production. Um, this is an interesting slide. I almost took it out because it's no longer applicable, but it shows how quickly things can change. Um, in uh, 2018, Americans spent an average of 9.7% of their total disposable income on food at home and food away from home. That's gonna change a whole lot this year. Um, 1.7 trillion was spent on total food expenditures in the U.S. in 2018. That was up 78.2 billion from the previous years. My guess is that in 2020, you're going to see a substantial drop in total food dollars spent. Not because people are buying less food, but because they're buying more for home consumption and they're not going out to restaurants. Here are... Uh, the uh, different value-added food sectors uh, by shipment size. We have meats, again, dairy, grains and oil seeds, beverages, fruits and vegetables, bakery and tortilla products, sugar and confectionery, and then a massive slice here. You got seafood small, but other, other takes up so much. This is billions and billions of foods, uh, billions, billions and billions of dollars worth of food uh, diversified over a lot of different products. I'm going to talk quickly about food at home. I pulled this stock photo uh, to talk about food at home because uh, I wanted to show you the shopping cart and, and sort of ask yourself if your shopping cart ever really looks like that. It doesn't. That's what we imagine food at home should look like. In fact, food at home really looks more like this. Um, and I want you to look at this cart 
and notice that of the food items in here, the vast majority are value-added food products that were manufactured in a food factory and not just fresh produce that was picked out of a field and put into a bag. You have a little bit of that, but if you look up here in the middle, like even the greens here, these are chopped and washed greens. They didn't come straight out of a field. They had to go to a processing facility. So the processing industry is often under uh, recognized for how important it is. We like to think we're all eating fresh fruits and vegetables coming right off the farm, but the fact is, is that's usually the exception and not the rule. I wanted to find out where the value added foods are in my house, so I went to the source, opened up the refrigerator and looked in there, and I couldn't find a single thing that didn't come from a food factory that's not a value added food product, possibly the eggs. But other than that, there's not a whole lot there. I looked in the cupboard, same thing. Everything's coming out of a box. I looked in the freezer, same thing. Everything's coming out of a box. Looked in the Lazy Susan, same thing. Everything's boxed or jarred. There's another freezer full of value added. And I finally found the one thing that I think may not categorize as a value added food product in the entire Mills household this onion right here down at the lower corner is a non-value-added food product possibly everything else is value added food away from home um wanted to talk about this because as of three months ago the average american was actually spending more money away from home on food than they were at home and they spend money in many, many different ways. They go to festivals and, and food trucks are big. Uh, in Asheville, what, 10 years ago, food trucks weren't even allowed. And now there's dozens of them on the street. And uh, they're create, creating jobs and economic opportunity for a lot of low-income individuals who otherwise might not have that same opportunity. We've got casual restaurants, Mexican Grill just now starting up again. Then you have the fine dining. In Asheville and in Western North Carolina, the fine dining industry is, a, is, is larger than in most places. And farmers do have excellent opportunities to sell to fine dining establishments because they want to source local. And uh, you can't get everything that you want in fine dining off of a Cisco or a US foods truck. But this is the chart that uh, sort of tells a story of a trend that was happening and has on a dime completely reversed. In about 2011, food dollars spent away from home started to exceed food dollars spent at home. Um, 869 billion food away from home expenditures in 2017. If we just extrapolate the last three months as one quarter of a year, we can see that probably about $230 billion in food away from home expenditures did not happen in the last three months. That's a massive amount of money. At home expenditures totaled $747 billion. I would guess that's probably much closer to a trillion dollars this year than in uh, than 747. Again, food away from home, food full service restaurants, limited service restaurants, schools and colleges, food furnished and donations, hotel and motel, retail stores and vending and recreational places and other. This is completely dead business right now. It is starting to come back. And I'm guessing by July and August, maybe the food dollars being spent away from home will come back to somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% or so of the norm. But my guess is we're not going to go back to food away from home expenditures exceeding food at home expenditures for several years. That means that the supermarket is more important to your business than the restaurants. 
I want to talk briefly about characteristics of successful small businesses. And these, this is just observations. I've been in this uh, line of work for about 20 years now. And I look back at what small food businesses I've worked with uh, that have succeeded. When I think about what characteristics do they have, a few things come to mind. The first is that they're passionate about their product and their company. Um, not to the point where it's just about making some money. It's about making a product that they're proud of, that they believe in, and growing a company that they're proud of and they believe in. Simply having uh, a food to sell to people on the street is not what successful food businesses are about. They're about uh, a commitment to uh, growing their business, having an excellent product, and adopting it um, to some degree as a as a life choice rather than uh, something that you do on a nine to five basis. Successful small food businesses almost always offer something different, hard to find, and in demand by a defined population. The trick here is not to be so different that nobody wants your product. You also want to catch trends as they're on an upward swing, not after they've already played out or too soon before they become trends. Um, the example that I come up with right now is uh, No Evil Foods is one of our uh, graduate companies from Blue Ridge Food Ventures. They started producing plant-based meats in 2014, I believe. Um, right as the plant-based meat revolution was really starting to take off in a big way. They went from uh, a couple selling at uh, tailgate markets uh, on Tuesdays and Saturdays to a company with 90 full-time employees probably hitting north of $5 million in sales and selling to Walmart, Target, um, and most of the major grocery stores on the East Coast. Attractive packaging is really, really important, and it's something that some people overlook. They might believe in their product, but not believe that the packaging is all that important. If you're going to spend any dollars on marketing, spend money on design and packaging development so that people like that box. If they don't pick up the box or the package or the jar or like the label, they're never going to get to the point where they can taste what's on the inside. Another characteristic is that products that succeed from small businesses are not prone to price competition. And when I say not prone to price competition, that doesn't mean that there's none. It means that you can charge a pretty good premium for your product because it is harder to find, more desirable, perceived to be superior to sort of generic mass produced uh, alternatives. Um, doesn't mean you can charge whatever you want, but I do believe that successful small businesses don't try to compete with Walmart. Um, you'll never win if you're trying to compete with the big boys on price. You've got to go for superior quality and providing something that you can't get from uh, Procter & Gamble. You need some decent shelf life. Generally, whatever you've got, if you've got less than a three month shelf life, you've got an issue. A lot of retailers aren't gonna to wanna to take your product. Um, ideally, you're gonna have a one year shelf life for most of your product if you can get it that way. Um, most of what you guys have told me you're making uh, does have extended shelf life. So that gives you an opportunity to produce in large quantities all at one time and then sell out your stock. Uh, you don't want to have to go into the manufacturing every week. Uh, if you can make it all once a month, you're doing, uh, you're saving time and money. One of our successful sauce companies uh, at Blue Ridge Food Ventures comes in about every five or six weeks, comes in with five people, rents the kitchen for 10 hours, makes about 3,000 units of his product and goes away. Most of that gets retailed at farmer's markets. He does some wholesale at uh, supermarkets and restaurants, but, uh, but he produces one day out of 45, I would say on average. And he's probably making $50,000 a year doing what he's doing. Steady growth. This is the characteristic that 
really tells the story for a lot of our success stories. Um, steady growth, you start direct retail to small wholesale to larger distribution. There are cases where people are quote unquote overnight successes, but I have rarely met them. Most people work for a long time, laying the groundwork, um, going out to farmers markets or tailgate markets or doing point of sale promotion in small stores before they get to the point where they're shipping pallet loads of product to the Ingalls warehouse in Black Mountain. Some major trends in the American food market. Again, this has not been uh, amended for COVID, so some of these things are not going to be true. Protein alternatives, faux meat some more. This is not changing. This is actually COVID has accelerated some of these trends, and this is one that clearly has been accelerated. Spices and flavor, ethnic infusion tastes. Americans want stuff that kicks. Uh, there's a lot of attraction to um, Latin American food and Asian foods that I would say 30 or 40 years ago, your average American would have thought was just a little too spicy for them. But more often, um, I know in my house, our capsaicin tolerance has gone up a whole lot in the last 10 years. Biological functionality. It's good for you. People want the food they eat to be their medicine and the medicine they eat, they eat to be their food, um, if, if, if you will. Um, so things like kombucha, which is a living biological organism that people are drinking for, uh, for better health for their digestive systems, that's going very, very well for a lot of people. Um, of course, there is um, the hemp extraction uh, that is happening right now. There's some debate as to whether that's a food or not, but it is seeking biological functionality. All natural, local, ethical, and made with integrity. This is what uh, discerning consumers who are paying top dollar are looking for. Um, you'll notice I didn't put in organic because organic has become so ubiquitous it's almost no longer a thing. People are looking for natural, local, ethical, beyond whether or not you've got an organic certification. Fermented, brewed, aged, and crafted. Um, this is a big one here. Um, fermented foods are getting big. Um, obviously, we have a, uh, a, a major brewing industry in Western North Carolina now that didn't exist just a few years ago. Um, these are things that people are looking for. This is also a sign of a more sophisticated uh, consumer audience um, and people who are willing to pay a little bit more uh, for their food. Healthy fats. Somebody is in the lard business here. Lard's no longer bad for you from what I understand. Um, so anything that promotes healthy fats, people are looking for. And ecologically friendly packaging. Um, and this is harder than it seems. Um, biodegradable packaging is really, really difficult for some, uh, some food items. Um, and I think that the packaging industry is working very hard to get there. But, um, you know, biodegradable plastic type wraps are very, very expensive. Hopefully the price will come down. Um, but people who are willing to, again, people who are willing to pay top dollar will pay more for an ecologically friendly box. Um, do we have any questions we need to address right now, y'all, or are we, are we in a good place? We are in a good place right now. Okay, cool. Uh, I want to go over some key resources. Uh, most of you sound like you're starting a new food business. Um, and so, uh, the good news is this is an industry that is heavily supported by a lot of, uh, government agencies and nonprofits. Um, it's good for you. Some of these you're going to know a lot about already, but I want to make sure that nobody uh, misses the opportunity to tap into support. Uh, first place I recommend that you go is your local small business center. Um, and uh, you've got some fantastic small business center directors in Western North Carolina. I'm not just saying that because they happen to be online here, um, but they are good and um, they understand their local markets and they understand their local businesses. So I would encourage you to uh, go to the Small Business Center in your county. NC Cooperative Extension Service, a uh, fantastic resource. This is a national, you know, NC Cooperative Extension was a national model for extension development nationwide, and it continues to be one of the most well-funded, well-developed uh, 
support services out there. Um, food safety and processing, their website has all kinds of research that's available to you. Um, but uh, going to your local cooperative extension office and getting to know the people there is, is important no matter what type of food business you're in. Uh, Blue Ridge Food Ventures, uh, which I help manage, uh, is an 11,500 square foot shared use food processing center in Asheville. Um, we have helped to incubate uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 businesses since opening in 2005. In a given year, we typically work with in the neighborhood of 50 different small businesses on formulation, figuring out the types of equipment you might need, figuring out um, production flow, um, and, and, and zeroing in on the cost of goods sold when it comes to the manufacturing business. So we encourage you to work with us if appropriate, um, but if you're in the western uh, counties that the Empowering Mountain Food Systems uh, program is serving, then please work with Laura because she has resources that can help you access Blue Ridge Food Ventures as well. Asheville Area Food Guild is a new trade association that was established last year um, of value-added food businesses. Um, and I know um, the Asheville Area Food Guild uh, does extend to any businesses in Western North Carolina. Uh, the businesses themselves ask that we call it the Asheville Area Food Guild and not the WNC Area Food Guild um, because people see Asheville as a marketing tool. Um, the idea I want to get to you is that if you live in Jackson County or Haywood County and you probably have a certain, like most, I grew up 50 miles from Charlotte, there's always a little bit of resentment against the big city and I get it. Um, that said, if you're trying to sell to people in New York and you say we are Asheville's finest herbal extracts or what have you, uh, and you're in Jackson County, that's good enough for them. But if you're selling in New York and you say you're Jackson County's finest uh, herbal extract, they're not going to know who Jackson County is. So identifying with Asheville for your marketing beyond the region is a totally appropriate and smart move, uh, even if you don't like Asheville very much. So, uh, next. The North Carolina Specialty Foods Association is uh, basically managed by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Division of Marketing. They um, put on trade shows and they do special promotions for value-added foods. A good organization to get to know and possibly get to join. Um, again, the division of marketing within NCDA, they're the folks who manage the farmers, the large farmers markets in North Carolina. They also have dedicated staff who focus on things like agritourism, aquaculture, uh, marketing field crops, um, international trade, uh, good, strong organization, but you've got to tap into them. You've got to ask them for support because they don't get out this way very often. USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, this is a resource of online research. If you're in the beef business, you can click on beef retail activity reports, egg sales, lamb sales, uh, value added specialty crops, thousands and thousands of pages of market research that's available on this website it would behoove you to spend a good hour or two just cruising around the AMS site and learning what they've got available for you. Smithson? Yes? If you can go back to that slide, please. Sure. Um, Angela has a question about, um, you know, her, and it's kind of off topic for us, but I'm assuming you know the answer or can help direct us. Is, is this uh, a good place to start uh, the foreign ag service here on the left side of that uh, screenshot you have about the uh, importation of Italian foods? I don't um, know, <clears throat> NCDA, who might be the person there? Well, uh, here's the thing, here's the problem. Kind of granular. There, nobody is employed to help you sell imported foods into the US. Um, now, there might be an Italian Foods Importers Association, <laughs> I don't know, um, but you're not going to get marketing support from North Carolina or U.S. employed individuals to sell Italian food in the U.S. Um, so, 
uh, don't know what to tell you. I mean, we've, we've had clients who did uh, repackaging of Italian products, specifically olive oil, um, which was the, the legal occupation of Vito Corleone, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of opportunity for imported Italian foods. Um, just the marketing support from USDA and NCDA is really not, not going to be there. Thank you. Blunt answer, but it's, it's true. Um, so a lot of people say, well, gosh, how do I know this will even work? Well, I can show you here are the logos, uh, and names of companies all located in Western North Carolina who are engaged in value added food production. And some, all of these, as far as I know, every single one of them started out as a very small family owned business. Some of them are still very, very small family owned businesses, but some of them have grown and some of them gotten quite big. Um, and there, there's room for everybody according to their aspirations. If your aspirations are to make a decent income for you and yourself and not have to take on any employees, you can do that. If your aspiration is to grow your business into a $10 million a year sales with 50 full-time employees, that's doable too. We have plenty of good examples in Western North Carolina of success. And um, fortunately, we have a lot of folks in the area who have worked with them and have a lot of background information about how these organizations succeed or have succeeded. And uh, so you don't have to make the same mistakes they make. And I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to talk about empowering mountain food systems. Everybody, um, I see we've had some additions here, so so welcome. Um, if you missed the beginning part, uh, Tiffany Henry is recording this session, so it will be available to you. And um, we do have three more sessions coming up uh, that will have a deeper dive into the the services at Blue Ridge Food Ventures. Um, as well as food safety issues and, and marketing. So we're really excited about this series and glad that y'all are here. Um, sorry, the slide kind of got messed up on, on my um, lettering here, but I'm the project director for Empowering Mountain Food Systems. You can see all those logos there. Uh, we are a project of North Carolina Cooperative Extension and Smithson gave us a fantastic uh, reference. We appreciate that. And we're funded by the Appalachian Regional Commission and also the Cherokee Preservation Foundation. Uh, my office is based at home now in Whittier, but normally I would be working at the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indian Cooperative Extension Office in Cherokee. And I've just got a few slides here. Oh, I can't advance. Okay, there yeah, just, just tell me when you want me to move it. Okay, so sorry, these slides do not translate well into Smithson's format. So, but we right. have. We have the good information, so that's cool. Um, so our goal, we're here for three years, and our goal is working in this tippy point of North Carolina. You see that blue tip there. We're working in those counties, and our goal is extremely specific to improve the regional food system through education, entrepreneurship, and production uh, assistance. Um, and so we have many uh, resources to help you do that. Okay, go Smithson. Mm -hmm. And the one that um, I hope y'all will be most excited about because you're on this call is we have a collaboration with uh, CAFE and Blue Ridge Food Adventures um, to support you uh, if you live in that, that seven county region uh, in your production practices. Uh, CAFE will guide your product development, recipe development, ingredient sourcing, regulatory requirements, all the other things that we'll be talking about uh, in the next three parts of this series. And, and we, if I could jump in real quick, um, CAFE is the parent nonprofit for Blue Ridge Food Ventures. That's right, right, the Center for Ag and Food Entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, so we have $3,000 of support for you. And so uh, we are, we're really excited to help you like with Smithson was talking about, you know, you need some, you know, label design. We have even separate funding uh, to help you with that part. We can work with graphic designers and, and marketing specialists. Um, next slide. 
So here are some of the other uh, products that we have. So um, in addition to the $3,000 in support uh, directly to CAFE and Blue Ridge Food Ventures, we also have equipment support. Uh, recently, we had a client who uh, is starting a kettle corn business. Well, we purchased her kettle corn uh, maker. Uh, we have a, a business who is um, starting to create apple cider out of her, um, apple cider vinegar out of her excess apples. We, we are helping her fit up her kitchen for that. Um, so for those smaller uh, amounts, we have straight up $3,000 uh, equipment and supply grants um, that is paid to the vendor. So we work with you on that process. Um, we have a cost share program. If you have a much bigger project, uh, say you need to build a new, a new certified kitchen uh, and you want to get a loan, we are working with some of these smaller um, CDFIs uh, in the region uh, to help with uh, loans for you. Uh, and then um, we have uh, up to 7,500 cost share on uh, loans with these lenders. Um, all of this happens through our application process. So next slide. Oh, sorry, one more um, resource that we have, these business support services. Uh, again, like you know, Smithson was talking about, um, and, and somebody had a question that we'll address about liability insurance. So we can help you pay for that insurance uh, for the first couple of years of your project. And, um, and again, the graphic design support, social media coaching. Right now with the changing uh, marketing environment, we're supporting folks uh, getting online, doing online sales. So um, all of this support is here in the region until April, 2022. Uh, but it's very important that you, um, you start the process through entering our application portal. So next slide. And we have this link um, where it says apply here. Uh, and also you can just reach out to me. There's my email and my phone number and I can direct you to, to the link um, of how to apply. But uh, we have a, a full-time local food agent. Uh, we have a listening session actually tomorrow that uh, we'll send you, or Thursday, we'll send you a notice about um, so we're, we're trying to figure out what other training y'all need and, uh, and how we can support your business uh, over the next couple of years that we're here in the region. So um, that is the end of our slide set. So we will go back to um, our questions. Um, Smith, we had a really good question about liability insurance. Uh, okay. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm trying to open the Q&A. I guess I have to stop share in order to see the Q&A. Is that right? Um, well, um, let me, I don't, I think that question, oh, let me see if that question is in here. I can read it to you. Was, okay. I was wondering who on average has the best product and liability insurance? Okay. Um, well, you know, there is a new um online program a consortium of insurers got together and created something called the food liability insurance program flip um i would encourage you to take a look at that google it um research it it seems to have lowered pricing for a lot of small businesses that said i don't want to not give other insurers an opportunity to match or meet that if you have a personal relationship with an insurer in your community you might want to take a research the flip offers and then maybe go to them and say hey can you match this because you don't want to take business away from local folks but the fact of the matter is, is this flip program has dramatically lowered a lot of insurance costs for a lot of people thank you smithson um Catherine had this question, uh, seeking any extra advice about how to gain label approval through USDA uh, FSIS for lard, please, including special claims. You may have addressed that already. I just want to make no. sure that Catherine, no. okay? Yeah, we pushed that back a little bit because I thought it would be interesting to a lot of people. Um, when we, we, okay, at Blue Ridge Food Ventures, we don't do meat, so we're not in a regular communication with Food Safety Inspection Service personnel. 
Um, but we are in touch with um, the, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Food and Drug Division. And so when clients come to us with a label that we think might be stretching a claim or may not be in full compliance, we call that local inspector and show it to them. And now we, they don't like to say, they don't like to give a whole lot of guidance because they don't want to be, for whatever reason, they, they try to say yes or no. But if you get a good relationship with a local inspector and say, you know, this is my, this is my label. If you saw this on the supermarket shelf, would you have an objection to that? And if they don't, then you're basically being told, yeah, we got no problem with that. If they do and they point it out, then you've got the opportunity. The people I would speak to are the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Meat and Poultry Inspection Division. They tend to be a little bit more accessible and a little bit more friendly than your federal employees with USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. Um, there is an FSIS office in Raleigh. It's a regional office, I think, for the southeast. You can go that route, but... I found it to be fairly bureaucratic and, and we don't get responses as quickly as we hope. So I would go for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Meat and Poultry Inspection Division, tell them you want to get in the lard business and you want to make sure that your label is correct and would they review it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Good advice, Smithson. Uh, we had a question, uh, what is the closing date for the application for the Empowering Mountain Food Systems grant? Uh, we the grant ends April 22 April 2022 um, so I mean we have this this funding and we're we're spending it out and so I wouldn't wait till March 2022 and say boy I need to get on that train because you know that money might be spent out by then so I guess the the answer is to um, I would apply in the next year uh, because we have a lot of folks in the um, in the queue now, and so we're we're doing a, a good job of spending money, and we we're now trying to help more aggregators who are uh, you know part, as Smithson was talking about as part of this new food economy uh, to to help folks to distribute more food um, in a, in different ways. So um, so John, the the answer is. Uh, I would apply in the next year for sure. All right, I'm wondering if there are other questions. Um, William Johnson wants uh, everyone to know that he would love to contact them when they're ready to sell because they may he may be wanting to buy bulk or know someone that will. So I'm gonna put his, oh, I, I don't know how to copy this. Uh, will, I'm gonna go ahead and put your, um, email address in here for everybody because uh, I think that's what you're asking me to do um, to contact you about uh, about bulk sales. And mm -hmm. William, I just, Mr. Johnson, I just wanted to say that, you know, I saw you said you're making hot sauce mustards and ketchups. Um, if you, if you want to learn more about how to batch up, we've got all the equipment needed for a uh, fairly large scale production of products like that. I wouldn't encourage people come to us if they're starting out and they wanna produce at a lower volume in their home kitchen or their home certified kitchen or whatever, quote unquote certified kitchen. But if you get to the point where you wanna make uh, you know, pallet loads of, of product, we have that capacity and we have the filling and packaging and all that equipment. And we can also provide that technical assistance whether or not you use our facility to manufacture. Um, and Laura's program will basically pay our staff to provide one-on-one -on -one consultation for that type of thing. Absolutely, so there's no, no need for y'all not to use the considerable experience. I think you've heard from this um, presentation today that Smithson has deep experience and can save you a lot of time of uh, digging and wondering and, and trying to figure this out on your own. So, you know, we want you to use these local resources as much as possible. So let me see, let me check our, our Q&A here. Um, as I, I did see some new folks come on, um, we didn't get a chance to hear from you, but we are about out of time, past out of time. 
Uh, are there any other questions y'all can put in the Q&A box or in our Zoom chat before we close for today? Um, Tiffany will be sending you an evaluation that's a very important part of our funding um, and also will help us to design uh, and meet your needs of the rest of the series. As Tiffany said, we've got these coming up the next uh, couple of Tuesdays. Uh, so we look forward to continuing this conversation and appreciate you, Tiffany and Smithson for helping us make this happen. But y'all have my number here and my email. If you have any questions about funding for your um, innovative value added product, we're, we're here to serve. So any closing remarks, Smithson? Um. No, I hope y'all found this to be interesting and um, look forward to being back here uh, next week with more information. Great. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Tiffany. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.